author of book one, Everything You Know is Wrong, Human Origins. Lloyd was a presenter for us at the summer seminars this last summer. And he is one of those few rare, extraordinary people that has been invited back to repeat. And after you see and hear his presentation, you'll begin to understand why. He, uh, well, he's a, he's a friend at this point. He really is. Uh, and, and he's an awfully good man, and he's got a brilliant mind, and you're going you're gonna to love this presentation. He's a native of Louisiana. He is a graduate of Tulane University. He has a B.S. in psychology. He's been a writer for over 25 years, and he's been a thinker for a lot longer than that. Ladies and gentlemen, Lloyd Pye. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that very much. Uh, for those of you that have seen this movie before, um, you're going to notice that the front end of it is going to be missing. I'm not going to do the part about Darwinism uh, because I'm going to add some material at the end that I didn't have at the last time, and I think you'll find it interesting. So what we're going to do is just start right in with the human origins in as much as the book is about human origins, and we'll, we'll go from there. All right, can we have the first slide? All right, everybody just take a minute and look at this. <laughs> this is, wait, that's right, I don't need to do that. This is what we're all told is how we began as human beings, that we came out of the primordial sludge and step by step evolved into what we are today. Everything in that chain up to us is eat, survive, reproduce, we are, what's it all about? We have that incredible ability to say and think, what's it all about? How'd that happen? That's what this is going to be about. What we're told is, of course, that we're a natural flow of things and that with this guy right here, we share a common bond that begins between eight and five million years ago. Eight and five million years ago. Reason being, we know that we have upright walking primates of some kind or other at around four million years ago. So they just jack it back and figure if we're upright walking at four, we probably split from a common ancestor with the down on all four apes between eight and five million years ago. We know we're upright walking at four because we have proof of it at 3.5. Next slide, please. These are the famous Laetoli tracks of Tanzania, Africa, discovered by Mary Leakey and her team in 1978. And here you see what they are. They're, we're in solidified ash. We have a large pair here, smaller pair here. We assume it was a couple moving along. And we see the, the track here in a blow up is not quite human. Looks, uh, it's different in several ways. But it's human enough to make it very clear that we have upright walking bipedal creatures 3.5 million years ago, no doubt, measured by ash fall, which is very accurate. So that's why we jack it back. If we were this upright at four, at 3.5, we had to be upright at around four, and that's where you get your dates of five to eight million years ago, the common split, I mean the split from the common ancestor. All right, now, next slide, please. Here's the depiction of how this happened. The vo nearby volcano laid out a layer of ash the creatures go walking along, leaving their tracks. Then another layer of ash comes, seals the layer, and then 3.5 million years later, a rivulet comes through here, cuts through, exposes one of the tracks. One of Mary Le Leakey's team sees it, and then they peel back the layers until they expose the whole thing. Miracle piled on miracle. It's, it's just amazing, an amazing discovery. Now, the reason I show you this is I want you to notice that all pre-humans that you will see in the books, and go back and you can check, they will show you a head that looks like this one pretty much, grossly, grossly primate in its characters, characteristics, rather, because that's what the skulls of all pre-humans look like. But then they'll always stick these human bodies underneath those heads. And this is a subtle brainwashing that is performed on all of us to make us think that these are, in fact, Prehumans, because that's what they're called. That's what anthropologists call them, prehumans. Now, you can't pretend that those heads are in any way human, so they don't, but they leave the body parts looking, you know, 
amazingly human. You have the, the hands coming down mid-thigh, and, you know, I hate to say it, but, God, this looks a lot like my body right there. <laughs> Point, point is, we're all being misled by these depictions and notice them continually. It's, it's the way I'm telling you. Now, next slide, please. Lucy is very famous. Everybody should know her story. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, 1974, A4 Valley, Ethiopia, discovered by Donald Johansson and his team. She is the first of the so-called prehumans. They are the Australopithecines, and she is one of the first types now, what we know from her is a um, remarkable amount because we have 40% of her body recovered. With mirror imaging, that gives us 80%. So much more than any other fossil at the time, it was just amazing. So we know a lot about her. She stood about 3 feet 6 inches to 3 feet 8 inches tall. Very diminutive relative to us. But her bones, all of her bones, are much more robust than ours. Her upper arm bone here, for example, which is much longer than ours would be if it was a human that size. This, this arm bone I, I would end about right here. Also, it would be about that thick. So we, we can see she's much more robust than we are in all of her dimensions. She has the head of a chimpanzee, which we cannot tell from her skull, as you can see, but from others like her. Head of a chimpanzee. But we do know that she walks upright because we have her hip joint and her pelvis, and we have her particularly her knee joint, all of which are amazingly human. So we know she walked upright, no question about it. She was an upright walking creature. Just didn't have bones that looked anything like ours, or a head for that matter. Now, one other thing I want to point out about this is the people that are paid to go out and find these fossils, these pre-human fossils, are paid to find pre human fossils. So what they do is they, they fudge it every way they can to make them look human, and they always have problems with the arms because all the arms of the prehumans are too long from here to here, from shoulder to elbow relative to us. So if you notice what they did is they fudged this way up beyond where it ought to be to get this up here, to get this up here so they could get the fingertip down around mid-thigh, when in reality it belongs down around here. Keep these little tricks in mind. This is all part of the subtle brainwashing campaign that is waged against you to make you believe that they're telling it to you straight about how this all happened. Okay, next slide. All right, as I said, these are the first four of the Australopithecines, and Lucy is one of the first kind, Australopithecus afarensis. We have Africanus, we have Robustus, we have Boise. All right, we have basically a pair of upright walking chimpanzees upright walking gorillas. You can see that, length of face, width of face, and sagittal crest, which modern gorillas have. It's that ridge of bone where their muscles attach to the tops of their heads. So from four million years ago to approximately two million years ago, we have a pair of upright walking chimps, a pair of upright walking gorillas, and that's it. Okay, now, at two million years ago, we have a transformation. We are told it is a transition, that somehow the Australopithecines segued into the next creature, which is Homo, Homo meaning man. You will see they are indeed more man-like than are the Australopithecines, which are clearly primates, upright walking primates. So, we have this changeover from Australopithecines to Homos. We're told that it is a trans transition. It is a transformation, as you will see with this slide. Next slide, please. Okay, here we go. Australopithecine, early Homo. Notice, if you will, this is not a transition. This would require 20 or 30 gradual changes to get in from this to this. It is an overnight change. It is just sudden. Boom. The Homos are here. I don't mean that like it sounds. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right, the homos are here. Here we go. The homo habilis, homo erectus, homo archaic, homo neanderthal, and then Cro-Magnon, homo sapiens, us. Notice neanderthal man going back and through the australopithecines don't look anything like us. Nothing. 
Here we sit right here, another transition. Now remember, we had four million years Australopithecines, approximately two million years. There's some overlap in here. And then here, 120,000 years ago only, boom, here we are. Suddenly, overnight, looking nothing like anything that has come before. The bones of all of these creatures are much thicker than ours, just like Lucy's were. And in every way, the shapes are dissimilar. They do not have, it's hard to tell looking straight on, but they have no foreheads. Their foreheads go straight back off their huge eyebrow ridges, neither of which we have. We have nice forehead here, we have no brow ridges. Huge, round, nocturnal vision eyes. So did the Australopithecines. These are primate eyes. Primates have this kind of eye. Huge, wide nasal passages indicating a big flat nose spread across the face. We've got our little uplift of bone sticking our nose off our face. We have rectangular, small, reduced eye sockets, very poor night vision. A dramatic change has occurred. The upper jaw sticks off the face, ours squished in. Nothing like us. Next slide, please. Profiles show the degree of change is startling. Prognathous mouth, no chin. Prognathous mouth, even more so. No chin, and then suddenly flat mouth, nice chin. Look at the change through here. Australopithecine, Homo erectus, Cro-Magnon. This is as big a leap from here to here as from here to here in anatomical terms. A light year, a light year. This is not a transition. These are transformations, despite what you are told by anthropologists. Next slide, please. Now, am I making it sound my way just because the heads go that way? No, look, let's look at a whole body. This is the, a Homo erectus called the Lake Turkana boy. Homo erectus, Lake Turkana boy. Now, notice, if you will, this guy's about 12 years old. His molars have not erupted yet. He already stands 5'8". He's going to grow to 6'6", six, six, maybe 7 feet in adulthood. We don't know how they grew. But already at 12 years old, he is a physically robust creature. Every bone in his body at 12 years old is far more robust, thicker, stronger than any bone in Arnold Schwarzenegger's body today. <laughs> True. Now, why do you, oh, excuse me, notice too, if you will, the length of his upper arm. And they have, he has some shoulder socket here, so they had to put it in the right place. So that forced him to put the fingertip pretty near where it belongs. It belongs a little bit lower, but pretty close. Now, what are bones like this all about? What's, what's the deal here? Why are they so robust? Your bones are a function of the torque your muscles can generate. Your, muscles, your bones have to be able to withstand the pressure that your muscles can generate. And if not, your muscles would break your bones. So when you're looking at bones like this, you're looking at an incredibly powerful creature. What are you looking at? You're looking at primate bones, primates of the earth. This is how the primates are built. Gorillas, chimps, Right on down the line. They are incredibly strong relative to us, are the primates. Five to ten times, pound for pound. They can come, you know, they'll come right out of the mother's womb, reach up, hands and feet, hook onto her belly, and she walks off. And they can hang on. Anybody's had a pet monkey knows what I'm talking about. Next slide. Okay, this is a chimpanzee, minus its hair due to disease, so you can see the musculature in here. And the strength of these things is amazing. Amazing. You could take a male chimp like this, not a gorilla, and put it in a room with Mike Tyson. It's a battle to the death, and they both understand that. Two or three minutes, this chimp is walking out. Now, he may be missing an ear or two. But the chimp is walking out. The chimp can tear him limb from limb, literally, apart. Understand that. Primate strength is nothing at all like human strength. Next slide. 
Same thing for Neanderthals, our supposedly closest, nearest kin until just recently. Neanderthal fingertip bone, human fingertip bone. Segment of Neanderthal thigh bone, human thigh bone. Look at the difference. Not even close. This is quarters to dimes, shovel handles to broomsticks. No comparison. Our supposed, and, and we used to be told absolutely they insisted they swore. We came directly from those guys. Even looking at this kind of evidence, that is what they insisted. Why? Because they have to explain it in terrestrial terms. Understand that science is hamstrung. They've painted themselves into a corner. They have to explain everything in terrestrial terms. They do not allow for outside intervention, whether that outside intervention is extraterrestrial or divine. And so they have to come up with explanations like this to suit the, the data which doesn't at all support their conclusions. Okay, next slide. All right, here's the drawing that shows it a little more accurately what the prehumans are vis-a-vis -vis the humans. Notice that in the drawings, the hands are down pretty much where they belong relative to ours. Also notice the rib cages are the upside down funnels of primates in the prehumans as opposed to ours. What's the situation there? Well, you can't tell it very well from here, but all of the prehuman heads are stuck on their bodies like that, the way primates are. Their heads are down in on their shoulders. Only we have that elevated neck sticking our head up off of our torso. They also have that extra arm length and that extra power, and so they need a bigger fulcrum up here to, to wing their arms and do what they have to do. So all of that extra muscle mass plus the head torque down in there squeezes out the room, and so you get, you're going to get that pinched off triangle that primates have. And we, with our shorter, lighter arms and lighter bones, we don't need all that muscle mass, and we got our heads sticking up, so we have a completely different rib cage. I want you to understand that. Now, the, the main thing to understand here is there is not a single human bone in the so-called prehuman fossil record. The main thing I want you to understand, there's not a single human bone in the so-called prehuman fossil record. And guess what? Anthropologists will not argue the point with you. An idiot can see it. An idiot can see it. All you got to do is point it out to them. Well, they know that. So they say, you're right, you're right. There's not a single human bone in the prehuman fossil record, even though we insist that these are indeed prehumans. The reason we can get away with this is because we're going to put somebody right in here that's going to show a transition between these guys, and that is the missing link, the famous missing link. You've all heard about that. This is what it is. This is the thing that's going to stand right in here and miraculously show a smooth transition from this to this. Well, I tell you what, if it, the missing link was here today, he would need about 20 or 30 cousins standing right beside him showing enough gradual transition to make this plausible. You don't just get one missing link. You need dozens to make this theory work of gradual transition, the Darwinian paradigm. And they don't even have so much as a fingernail, not a fingernail, of the missing link. Which leads us to conclude that Charles Darwin is a blowed up peckerwood. <laughs> However, they will not concede that fingernail that's missing in that direction. Darwin's still intact, everything's still okay. Missing link's gonna show up. It's been 140 years, not yet, but he will show up. Okay, next slide. All right, the throat thing, I want you to get that clear in your mind. Notice, if you will, this is a standard primate throat, and of course, this is our throat. A complete redesign, complete. Not least of which is the fact that they can breathe and eat and swallow and drink at the same time and not choke. We, of course, you know what happens when we do. The peas come out of our nose when we start coughing. <laughs> okay, so the point is that primates with this kind of throat can make tremendous amounts of noise. Anybody who's been to a monkey house or, you know, at the zoo, you know what I'm talking about. Hoops, hollers, screams, howls. They know no limits. They can just puncture your eardrums, some of them, howler monkeys particularly. But they cannot do the thing that we can do 
with our throats, which is what I'm doing right now, this minute. Break those sounds into little bitty pieces. It's called modulating. They can't modulate. They can't speak. And try as we might uh, to teach them to speak, and we do. You know, Coco, they've been working for her, what, 20 years now? Up to maybe 3,000 words. You could put her in a third grade class and she could probably be valedictorian. But she can't speak. She can't speak, and she's never going to be able to because she doesn't pack the gear, as they say in the military. She doesn't pack the gear and never is going to. No primate is. We are completely different and completely special because of it. Next slide. All right, now, so here's what we're left with. This supposed smooth transition right on through from the early ones to the later ones, including this. Now, you can see, I hope, that all that's really happening here is the brains are getting bigger. And it's harder to tell because the Neanderthals and the archaics, their brains are expanding back here in what's called an occipital bun. But they're getting bigger every step of the way. It surprises most people to find out that Neanderthals had bigger brains on average than we do, 1,500 cc to 1,400 cc. Bigger brains than we have, Neanderthals. We shrunk somehow and got so much smarter. Figure it out. <laughs> Point is that we're told that all these guys went extinct at 30,000 years ago because that's when we see the last Neanderthal. That's when we find the last Neanderthal fossil, 30,000 years ago. Okay, so they, they went extinct and that's it and we're left behind. We were told for a very long time that we appeared at 30,000 years ago that Cro-Magnon appeared right as the Neanderthals ended, so it, made real, it was a real nice fit. You know, we appeared somehow, we killed them all, and that was it, transition, we took over the lease, and that was it. So, the reality then later proved to be that these guys existed at least 120,000 years ago. These guys existed down into 30, so you got this huge overlap of nearly 100,000 years where they're living basically side by side on the planet, and not killing each other off. So that one kind of went out the window, so they said, all right, so we didn't evolve from the Neanderthals, we evolved from the Homo erectus. You saw the Lake Turkana boy and how much we look like him. We evolved from him now. That's the new theory. Okay, you can see the problem. Now, did this really happen? Did they all go extinct? Well, why would they go extinct? No natural predators. Meanest dudes in the valley. They can take a lion on head to head and tear it apart. That's how strong they are, and that's how big they were. So what would, what would make them extinct? Could we do that? Yes, we could. We are vicious little buggers. <laughs> we are smart. We hunt in packs. We are pack animals. We're hyenas. We're two-legged hyenas. And we have a savage territorial imperative. Together, we could kill any of them. One-on-one, -on -one, they'd just pop our heads off like a pimple. Understand that. So, given that, what if what we did was instead of driving them to extinction, we just drove them where they don't make fossils anymore? What if that happened? Is that a plausible scenario? Let's take a look at it. All right, let's look at the Earth first, where these guys were living. The Earth is divided into geological niches. I mean, excuse me, ecological niches. Ecological niches. You have the prairies, the savannas, the grasslands, the lightly wooded areas, primo niches. That's where everybody like us would like to live. You know, it's comfortable. The not-so-nice niches are the heavy, deep, dense forests, jungles, swamps, bad places like that, where we kind of live on the edges, but we don't really live in the heart of darkness. We think we do, but we don't. So what if these guys lived in the primo niches, which they did because they were leaving fossils? And guess what? You leave fossils in the primo niches, in the prairies, savannas, grasslands, lightly wooded areas. Why? Because it's very unique that a fossil gets formed of this kind, because you have to die in very specific circumstances. You have to get caught in a, in a flash flood so that your body is washed away, covered up by mud so predators can't get you. Your flesh rots off, the minerals leach into your bones, and you become stone and you become a fossil. Or you get killed at the water hole. One day you're really tired, you're really hot, you're not paying attention. You go down to drink, the lion jumps on your back, kills you right there at the edge of the water hole, and then the wildebeest herd comes up behind him, run him off, stomp you down into the mud, and now same process. You're covered by mud, your flesh uh, 
rots off, your bones are, uh, the minerals leach into your bones and you, you become a fossil and that's it. And that's pretty much it. It's very hard to form a fossil otherwise. And so we see how miraculous that process is just to make them in the first place and then millions of years later it washes up or whenever it washes up and somebody sees it that knows what it is and can recognize it and can save it. it it's miracle stacked on miracle. That's why they're so few and they're so rare and they're so precious because of that. Now, understand this, that in the deep woods and jungles of the world, they don't make fossils. doesn't happen. You get your water out of the environment. You don't have a water hole. You get out of your food and things like that. It will surprise you to know that there is not to this day a single solitary fossilized bone of a chimpanzee in the world that we know about. They just don't make fossils. So, instead of them all going extinct, why don't we just postulate that they lived in the primo niches, this guy arrived sometime prior to 120,000 years ago when he starts leaving fossils, and he issues an eviction notice to all of these. Get out of town. We're here. We're taking over. And they do, and there'll be some skirmishes. They'll kill a few of them, and these guys, you know, they're not that stupid. They'll figure it out. These guys are bad news. We've got to move. And because they're adapted to the planet, we've seen the millions of years they're here, they're adapted to this place. They can go pretty much anywhere they want to, and so they do. They just walk until we don't chase them anymore, and that's into the deep woods and the jungles of the world. And if that scenario is true, and I postulate that it is, then it would explain the hundreds and thousands of stories that we have from around the world of what? upright walking, hair-covered creatures living in the deep forests and jungles of the world, every continent except Antarctica, the hominoids. It explains the hominoids. You with me? Okay, next slide. Let's take a look at a hominoid. Here we go. This is a statue of a Bigfoot Sasquatch type carved Willow Creek, California. This gentleman's about 5'7". I'm 5'11". You can figure that if that thing was here, it'd be, his head would be up about right here. Okay? There are four kinds of hominoids. Four kinds. We know of two in the West primarily. Sasquatch Bigfoot, this kind. Abominable Snowman Yeti. And then there are two other kinds that are dominant in other parts of the world that we don't know very much about. The Almas and the Agagwes. Okay, now we're going to go over them. They're pretty much the same, except for size. All right, the Bigfoot Sasquatch kind, as you see, 7 to 10 feet tall, 700 to 1,000 pounds on average. The giants, the big ones, the ones you hear the most about. The abominable snowman yeti, man-sized, 5 to 7 feet tall, 300 to 600 pounds, lives exclusively in the Himalayan ranges as far as we know. Taken together, those five ranges are as big as the United States, plenty of room to roam, but they are not on all continents. The Bigfoot Sasquatch kind is. The third kind, Almas, the Almas. They are found primarily in the mountains of southern Russia and western China, the Pamirs and the Caucasus and the Altais and the Tian Shans. But they are also elsewhere in the world, including in the United States. Man-sized again, seven to five, uh, excuse me, five to seven feet tall, 300 to 600 pounds. Fourth kind, the Agagwes, about four feet tall, weigh about 200 pounds. The pygmies of the group. All right? Now, you might remember, ironically, there were four Australopithecines, four early homos, and what a surprise, there are four types, basic types of, of hominoids. Interesting, isn't it? Now, what they are is this. The, the Bigfoot Sasquatch kind live in what is called lower montane forests. Now, in mountainous terrain that are covered by trees, and if you've done any flying in the Pacific Northwest, you know what I'm talking about, the lower trees are called lower montane. As you go up, you get into upper montane. The Bigfoot Sasquatch lives in the lower montane. The abominable snowman lives in the upper montane uh, forests of the Himalayas. You get the idea, abominable snowman, he lives up in the snow. Nobody lives in the snow. There's nothing to eat there. They live in the upper valleys, and you see them occasionally as they cross from one valley to the other by going over a mountain, uh, uh, the snow part of it. Okay, now the Almas also live in the lower montanes, but they're more flexible. They also seem to be the smartest, and this is not to say they're anything like us. They're just very smart animals. 
the Almas are. I think they're going to prove out to be living Neanderthals. The evidence is strong that the Almas are living Neanderthals. Okay? The Agagwes, the fourth kind, the pygmy kind, live in the jungles of the world. That jungle band that goes through South America, Central Africa, and Indonesia, that area. They, of the four, have reddish, russet-colored hair, like orangutans, which also live exclusively in jungles around the world. The others have dark browns and blacks, their body hair, covered with hair. Whenever anyone sees them, their characteristics are described consistently the same. Wherever in the world, whatever kind we're looking at, when the person sees it, and frequently this is some very, very isolated na native who doesn't even know that the rest of the world is out there, much less that these things are seen on other continents. And when they describe them, they always describe them the same way. They say, no forehead, huge brow ridges, big round deep set eyes, big flat nose, although this one isn't so big, but big flat nose up against their face, mouth sticking off their face, no chin, head tucked down into their torso, very long arms dangling around their knees, very thick, muscular, robust bodies, and covered with hair from head to toe. Now, take away the hair, and what did I just describe to you to a T? The prehumans. Am I right? You saw, the, you saw the skeletons. You saw the bones. The prehumans. What does this lead us to believe? The prehumans are the hominoids. The hominoids are the prehumans. The prehumans are the prehominoids. It's their ancestors, not ours. It's clear to anybody that will look at the evidence. The so-called prehumans are, in fact, prehominoids. Now, it's easy for me to stand up here and say this. What's the proof? Well, let's start right here with their feet. They leave tracks. All around the world, they leave tracks. We have upwards of 10,000 or more photographed, plaster-casted, or both. No question about it. And guess what? They're all fakes. All of them, every one of them is a fake. <laughs> Problem being, it's not that they are really, in fact, fakes. They just can't be real. They can't be real because not only is Darwin a blowed up pecker wood, all of his followers are. And they don't want to be that. So these cannot be real, even though they are. Now, is, is it possible that they could all be fakes? All these tracks could be fakes? Could they fool everybody? No. Why? Because we know a lot about it. Let's take a look. There's a science called ichnology. And what, this, what an ichnologist does is he studies the tracks left in fossils by creatures going millions of years back. Show them a fossil, they can look at a print or a track or anything. They can tell you what made it. There's a whole science to it. If you go back into prehistory, all of our primitive tribes, the one thing, the one thing you had to pass on to your children was how to read the tracks in the area and know what they were so that they could feed their family out of the environment and so they could keep from feeding some wild animal's family. Very important. If you took everything we knew about, remember Tonto and those Indians, boy, they could just smell a track and tell you 20 things about what made it. We know about tracks. And this is two of the basic things we know. That when any living fleshy foot, like a human foot or a hominoid foot or even a camel pad, it doesn't matter, makes a track, puts a track down, the subtle interaction of bones in the foot, in our case it's 26 bones, 33 joints, dozens of muscles, ligaments, and tendons, makes a very subtle movement and, and lays it down in a very specific way from the midline out, and so it leaves a distinctive print with little lines in here called compression lines. Next slide. When you do it with a fake foot, you, can't, you don't get that, that subtlety of movement because there's no sequential parts to a, a fake foot. If, you, if you're missing a foot and you need a prosthesis, you're going to get just a dull, stiff foot. We cannot duplicate anything even close to it. Even anything even close to a real foot. So whether this is plaster or rubber or plastic or wood, it doesn't matter if you're making a fake foot. It's going to be of a piece, and so when you put it down into the medium, you have to stamp it or press it as a whole, and in doing so, you get a very distinctive look to that, and it's a little ridge here with cracks on the top and the outside. Called, that's an impact ridge. So we have compression lines and impact ridges. 
Now, I can give this little lesson to a class of first graders, lay down a bunch of tracks here, real and fake, give them a magnifying glass, and they will not miss one. They will not miss one. Now, forest rangers that make their living out telling you, you know, bear, elk, zebra, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, they can tell you what it is. And no anthropologist will question their expertise. But if they see a hominoid track and they say, oh, boy, that looks real to me too, the anthropologist say, well, you don't know what you're talking about there. You don't know what you're talking about there. That one's fake. You're wrong there. See how absurd it is? And for the most part, you believe it because you don't expect them to lie to you. You don't expect them to have an agenda that they're maintaining. But they do and they do. And keep it in mind. Okay, next slide. All right, this is the way a human foot works. Looks and works. This is, of course, a, a, a good foot, not a flat foot. This is a typical human foot with an arch. When we come down on our heel, we have to swing our momentum around the arch, then cut it over into the ball, which will regenerate some of the lost momentum, and then we come out thrusting off of our big toe. That's how we walk. Our smaller toes pull up and act as balancers. If you notice your feet tonight when you walk around, notice how that works. Your big toe will go down, your other toes, toes will pull up, and it will leave in making a medium, an undisturbed ridge of medium here, in making a track rather, an undisturbed ridge of medium right here, but this of course will be squashed. Very distinctive print, no question about it. Now guess what? We walk badly, badly. When you do time and motion studies of us walking, we're, we're keeling around as we're swinging our momentum through our feet. We're locking our knees. We're basically throwing ourselves through our hips. Whoever do, That's why our joints wear out as we age. Our knees and our hips, we're using them badly. We walk badly. Whoever designed us needed to go back to the drawing board a couple of times more. They got lazy. It was a mistake. Okay. With that in mind, next slide. Let's take a look at a hominoid track, typical hominoid track. This is Bigfoot, 16 inches long, but taken in that really nice powdery dirt you get at the end of a hot summer, so it's a very clear, distinct print. Notice, if you will, the differences. We have a midline about right here, ankle shifted very far forward, heel extended back here and very much widened, forefoot shortened very much and widened, all five toes looking about the same shape, ironically, square, and all five toes acting as balancers because you have medium all the way through here. So you're getting the forefoot thrust coming out completely of the ball area, which is dented in, and it's like a two-part motion, sort of. So they have a completely different foot. It's a completely redesigned foot. Why? Completely redesigned creature. Much bulkier, much heavier, much denser, much more robust. So you need a different kind of foot. No arch is going to support that kind of weight, so you have no arch. Now, the funny thing about most real, quote, fake tracks is that the local yokels who make them make big human footprints and go out stamping those around. So, you know, immediately. They don't even have sense enough to know you've got to do it, you know, make a completely different foot. But the main thing to notice here is Remember, in our motion, we walk here, we go here, we do this, we do this, and we're very awkward. Look at the line of thrust here. Straight shot. What does this tell us? He walks right. <laughs> he does it better than us. He does it the way it's supposed to be done, he or she. Does it the way it's supposed to be done. Isn't that interesting? Next slide. Okay, this is something else that the best hominoid tracks have. Dermal ridges. Now it's kind of hard to see, but dermal ridges are your fingerprints on your feet. Fingerprints on your feet. This is why they take a baby's footprint when it's born. Fingers too small to deal with, just stick its foot on. Same thing. Individual, unique. Dermal ridges. And there you s Oh, I think my battery's running out. Oh, no. No, when I put it down here, it goes out. I may need a replacement part here if anybody's got one. Yeah, I know, but it, I think it's just because I shook the battery a little bit. All right, anyway, point is that whoever is make, whoever's faking these things out around the world, thousands of them, is taking the trouble 
to make articulating feet that if they would just put on the market, they could make a fortune in the prosthetics industry. And then they're taking the trouble to incise dermal ridges when lasers would have a hard time doing this. I mean, criminals, if this was easy to do, criminals would get their fingerprints fixed, would they not? Instead of cutting them off, lasers really couldn't do this kind of work, I don't believe. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. No, I got it. I'm going to go with this one for now. Okay. So, you with me? It's a conspiracy to end all conspiracies, this making the hominoid track conspiracies. And what I'm trying to get you to see is that is in fact absurdity piled on absurdity that they're asking you to believe. And again, for the most part, you do believe that. Most people who came in here today probably believed everything that the tabloids have to say about the hominoids. Problem being, if the hominoids are real, what does it mean? We are off the flowchart of natural life on Earth, and they don't want that to happen. Neither science nor religion. So in this instance, they hold hands and walk down the path together. Okay, next slide. All right, check this again. Comparison, Bigfoot track, plaster cast, human foot, just to get this in shape in your mind again. Next slide. All right, another pair of hominoid tracks, as you can see. These are so grungy looking on the soles because they were taken out of clay as opposed to dirt, as you saw earlier. But in every other way, they're, they're hominoid tracks, are they not? We found, you know, they're found together, so we assume it's a male and a female like the two that we saw walking along at the Laetoli tracks, right? Would everybody agree? This is as hominoid as it gets, right? Wrong! Guess what these are? Neanderthals. These are Neanderthal tracks, absolutely and without doubt. Torriano, Italy, a cave 30,000 years ago. Neanderthal artifacts all over the place. Neanderthals. Bonafide. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that the Neanderthals for sure are hominoids because they got hominoid feet stuck on them. Plus, they got hominoid heads stuck, as you saw from the skulls. Furthermore, we can assume, I think, fairly, that every one of the ones we saw earlier, all the way back to Lucy, four million years worth, had feet just like this and were, in fact, hominoids. The track you saw at Laetoli, remember the one down in the corner? It looked a heck of a lot like that, didn't it? The hominoids are the prehumans. That's the point I keep trying to make. Now, I'm extrapolating a little bit here. I'm taking a little risk because we don't have the feet nor the prints of any other prehuman. We just have to go with logic. But guess what we do have? We do have the feet of Neanderthals. Next slide. Here we go. Neanderthal foot, human foot, human foot, Neanderthal. Can everybody see this down at the bottom? I'm sorry, it's kind of low. Take a look so you can see. Stand up if you have to. be like a football game. All right, here's the deal. Notice there's no comparison. Look at the heel bone of the Neanderthal relative to our little nub of the heel bone. Look where our ankle base joint is as opposed to this huge, this is it, this is bone here. This is our little base joint compared to this giant base joint here and the squeeze forward of it. Notice, if you will, the great foreshortening of the forefoot and the widening of it relative to ours. Look at the skew. You can see the skew in the foot. See how squared up and solid that is like a rock. Look how much our big toe dominates our little four toes and how much these are much the same. This thing is built for balance, for solidity, for stability. We got a crummy foot, folks. Crummy foot and a crummy walk. We ought to complain to the boss about this. <laughs> you can see why this thing walks so smoothly. It's just kabloom, boy. It's just perfect for maintaining balance and stability, carrying all that heavy bulk and weight. Good design, bad design. Next slide. Okay, if I'm right, they're out there all these places. Where are they? All right, let's take a look at the world. Take away the deserts. Take away the tundra, and what you're left with is arable land, arable land, all right? This is where they live, in the black parts. The heavy, dense, deep forests and jungles of the world, this is where we live, the nice, cool, open areas, the pinks, the blues, and the purples, the primo niches, that's us, all right? Now, 
broken down, that is 55% for us, 45% for them, moving toward 40% for them. As you know, we're cutting down forests like crazy. It used to be 55% for them, 45% for us, 500 years ago, approximately. Okay, so you look at this and you say, well, wait a minute, we're sitting right here in the desert. We live, we, we live everywhere. No, we, we live in most of these environments, but we don't live for the most part up in these areas, in, in the Himalayas in here and in these jungles. If we live in the jungles, we live on the river. We don't live in the heart of darkness. When we have to live in the heart of darkness, what do we do? We cut it down. We'll cut roads through here, but we don't live in it where we've got to hack our way through every day to go to school or to the store. Just isn't going to happen. We're not physically designed for that. Our skin won't take it. If we, did, if we didn't have clothes and couldn't defeat the natural order of things, if you were to strip everybody in this room naked and put us out there to live like everybody else has to live, most of us would be dead in a few weeks from radiation poisoning. Those of us who have black skin would have a chance to make it to the equator but couldn't stay and live in cold climates. We're not physically adapted to this planet. Understand that. Our skin does not let us go except in certain niches, the primo niches. So understand, too, that we think we live in every one of the nooks and crannies out there. We are masters of all we survey. That's what we're told all the time. We're humans. We're masters of all we survey. We do not even survey all that we claim to be masters of. It will surprise you to know that of the United States alone, fully 25%, one-fourth, has never once been foot surveyed because it's just too hard to get in there and do the work. We survey from the air those areas. We do not go. We're not as tough as we think we are. Now, also understand that the hominoids are not just restricted to these areas. They move wherever there are forests. These are their, their real stomping grounds. But they go anywhere that there are forests. They use forests like highways because they are migratory animals. They migrate. They do not hibernate. They move with the seasons. And they use forests as their highways. They, in the, as they live in the forests, they do a split shift with the bears. Bears work the day shift, they work the night shift. It is, it's how it works. Also understand that of the 5,000 quality sightings that we have in the United States and Canada, now I'm not talking just you know, skimpy ones, I'm talking good quality sightings, 5,000 in the last 50 years, half have been east of the Mississippi River. Every state has them except possibly Nevada, maybe the, no, just the mountains <laughs> north. We have them in Louisiana, down in the swamps, the little one. It's called Rougarou. When I was a little boy growing up, don't you get too far from the house, Rougarou will get you. The little red man of the woods, the booger man, boogie man. Excuse me, booger man, right. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. Um, anyway, Florida has the skunk ape. Uh, New Jersey has the Jersey devils, Arkansas. Everywhere has them. I bet you every one of you have heard stories about this from your state. They're everywhere. And it's the same around the world. They share the planet with us. Okay, next slide. So, you say to me, well, okay, by George, we're humans. Why don't we just go out there and get one? Even so, we can do anything. Why don't we just mount up and go get one if there's so many of them out there? All right, Panda is a perfect example of what the problem is. The panda was last century's hominoids. Rumors would come out of China of this black and white bear that ate bamboo. And of course, every PhD in the world sitting behind his little desk does not even have to get his fanny up out of the chair to say, well, forget that. They, we know they have black bears. We know they have brown bears. We know they have white bears. But they're all carnivores. No vegetarian bears. You kidding us? Ridiculous. And then in 1869, a French naturalist goes to Sichuan Province, China, and sees the hide of a freshly killed one hanging on the wall, and he knows they're real. So every zoo and museum mounts up the expeditions that you would like to see mounted up today to go out to find the next panda and bring it in. Serious. Now, we're talking Sichuan Province, uh, an area the size of the state of Arizona, very mountainous, hilly terrain, 
difficult terrain covered with bamboo rather than woods, but in every other respect like the environment that hominoids will be found in. How long do you think it took those teams, and this is back in the 1800s where people really knew their way around the woods, how long do you think it took? 60 years, and quit, quit giving away my punchlines. Don't do that anymore. 60 years, 60 years. Those of you who've seen the movie do not give away the punchlines. Okay. Now, it sounds like a gross exaggeration, and it is. They only looked for about 30 years. This is where Ivy made the mistake. They only looked for about 30 years, and then they gave it up. And they said it has to be extinct now. And then 30 years later, Teddy Roosevelt's sons are out there doing some sport hunting, and they kill one. Okay? So then they mounted up again, knowing that they, it's for real now. And because they had learned so much in the interim, they began to get them. And over the next 20 years, they brought in six. And we have the panda craze, you know, that we have today. But even to this day, they're extremely difficult to go out into the wilds of Sichuan Province, China, and bring in a wild panda. Now, what is the panda doing that makes it so difficult to get one? Well, as you can see, it's very brightly colored and stands out very distinctively against its green background. It lives during the day. It eats a very restricted diet, bamboo. It's very slow-moving. You see them move in zoos. They're as stupid as a bag of hammers. They can't even reproduce in zoos. Can't even find each other and, or figure it out. I mean, <laughs> how, how stupid do you have to be? Anyway, the point is, they're not doing anything. They are living their lives, and the problem lies with us. We can't hack it in their world very easily. We think we're masters, again, of the world. We're not. We're not. And where they live is where the hominoids live. And the hominoids are bigger, faster, stronger, operate at night, eat anything in their world. They can hear better, see better, and I'm absolutely sure think better than we can. We're not going to just mount up and go get one because we've tried it many times and it hasn't worked. We're only going to see them by accident, encounter them by accident. And that's when it happens, and it happens a lot. We have good evidence on record of these encounters. Next slide. We're going to go over a few. The famous Patterson film, Roger Patterson took a film of a female hominoid walking along a creek, creek bank in 1967, October. You all saw this, well, not all, but some of you saw this recently on a television program called World's Greatest Hoaxes, all right? That itself was a hoax. That program was a hoax. I, I wrote a long email about this, and it's on my site if you'd like to read it, www.lloydpie.com. It's a defense of the Patterson film showing what they did not talk about in that program trying to make this film look like a hoax and pick on it, as people will do occasionally. There's no doubt that this is a bona fide film for a number of reasons we're going to go over. All right. First of all, it was a bright, sunny day, as you can see. What happened was the sun was shining such that it was glinting off of her shoulder and thigh as she walked, and you could see her muscles rippling in her shoulder, in her thigh, as she walks. In good slow-mo close-up, you can see that, which they did not provide in that, uh, in that program. All right. If that's a person in a suit, the suit has to be glued to naked skin. In the gluing process, you lose that flexibility, that ripple. The only thing that looks like this does in this film is real skin under, I mean, real skin over real muscle working. So we could stop right here. It's real just based on that. Right there. But we don't have to stop. The arm, if you've all seen her walk, she walks along like this. She drags her arm down around her knees where everybody says, you know, the hominoids do. Why? The elbow articulates right here, which is much longer from shoulder to elbow than a human. If that's a human in a suit, impossible. You can't get an elbow bend at the same point. So we could stop right there. Solid proof that that's not a human being in a suit. But furthermore, Jerry Romney, the guy they said was in the suit, they stuck him with breasts. What would they do that for? Why go to the problem? Why go to the trouble? As she walks along and she turns back to face him, you see the breasts sway and she takes a couple of steps and you see that nice jiggle that we all know. <laughs> if it's a person in a suit in 1967, it's going to be those early silicone jobs. Remember those? <laughs> 
Absolutely real right there. Furthermore, she left tracks in the hard-packed sand of the creek bed. One inch deep, we have pictures, we have casts. That cast you saw earlier of the cast in the foot, that was her foot. No question, inch deep, walked a 200-pound man beside her not long after. He sank about a quarter of an inch. So we know that as she stood there doing this, she weighed 600 to 800 pounds. Fake that. That's got to be a real lead line suit. 600 to 800 pounds as she walks. So we know that it was a legitimate film. Furthermore, as they pointed out in the program, with the fake films, they can never tell you where it happened and who did it, who took it, because they don't want that guy to be grilled and they don't want experts to go and measure one limb here and know how long how tall it really was. What Patterson did was he went right out fast as he could and begged every expert in the area that he could call, every anthropologist and zoo person, come out, bona fide sighting, please bring dogs. And you don't want to bring dogs because these things have a very powerful body odor that even, even tracking dogs will recoil from. If it's a person in a suit, it's like the suit's not even there, the dogs are after it. Patterson did, of course, no expert came. Needless to say, they never do. You can't get them to go because they know what will happen. A young man named Grover Krantz went out early in his career as an anthropologist, took a look at one, and he said, it looks real to me. And it's 30-some-odd years later, and I think he's still trying for tenure. <laughs> They've made a tremendous example out of Grover Krantz for what happens to people who side with the enemy in this issue, which is a very volatile, very sensitive issue. Okay, So no experts would come, needless to say. Patterson did everything right that he could except film something that could be real. Other than that, he was great. Okay, next slide. A man named Albert Osman, picture taken 1957, talking about an event that occurred to him 33 years earlier in 1924 when he was a young man, a timber cruiser in the woods, of southern British Columbia. He's taking some time off. He's out looking for gold mines, lost gold mines. He's sleeping in his sleeping bag one night, and suddenly Big Hand picks him up, shoves him to the bottom of the bag, slings him over its back like Santa's bag of toys, and scoops up his camp stores with the other hand and walks off with him. He is captured by a Bigfoot. He has marched for about an hour. He's got barely enough room at the top of the bag to breathe. The hand couldn't get quite around the bag, so he had enough room to breathe, but he stuck down the bottom of it. It dumps him out an hour later or so, and he's in a 10-acre basin of high, high rock walls where he can't get out, and there's one opening opposite where he is, and over there is the, the den of the, the living quarters of the male Bigfoot that got him, his mate, and their two offspring, a young male and a young female. And Albert Osman stays with them for six days before he can figure out a way to escape, which is very funny, very clever. Not going to go into it. Takes too long to tell. It's in the book, okay? But he gets away. The point of the story is not how funnily he escapes, but that he doesn't tell anybody for 33 years. Keeps it to himself, thinking everybody would think he was crazy, which they would do. And then in 1957, he reads an affidavit in a, in a paper by a man who saw one picking berries. And the man said, if anybody has an experience like this, would you share it with me? So Osman writes him a letter and says, that's what happened to me. Well, when people found out what happened to him, the roof fell in on the poor guy. Experts came in from all over the world. He had to take lie detector tests up the wazoo. You know how it works. And so you know that when you're telling a story, a long, detailed story, and it's a lie, you can't keep the details straight. You're going to goof it up, and they're going to figure it out. Sooner or later, you're telling a lie. He never goofed up. He passed all his lie detector tests. No, anybody that had anything to do with him, just read the testimonies, say he was absolutely A-plus, straight-up guy, telling a true story. Next slide. The famous Minnesota Iceman. Ice Child is more like it. This was a juvenile Bigfoot killed by a man named Frank Hansen in the woods of northern Minnesota. Ironically, in 1967, the same year that Patterson filmed his Bigfoot 2,000 miles away. All right? Now... Frank Hansen shot it in the back, blew out that nice hole in its chest, dropped it, severed its spine, dropped it down. It pulled its arm up to protect its face from him, as you can imagine, shot it through the wrist, through the left eye, blew the right eye out onto its cheek, and blew out the back of its head. Coup de gras, killed it dead. At that moment, 1967, Frank Hansen 
could have changed history. He could have taken this thing, crammed it down the throats of science, and we would not be having this discussion today. We would all accept hominoids as a reality from that point forward. No problem. But Frank Anson was not that kind of man. The kind of man he was, he saw the opportunity, he bought a seven-foot floor freezer, he threw the body in there, he filled it up with water, he froze it, he put a piece of plate glass over it, and he took it around to shopping malls and county fairs for about 12 years, from about 1978 to, excuse me, about 1968 to about 1980. Did anybody here besides me see it when it was out? There's always people that saw it, okay? So they can tell you that it was the real deal, okay? Now, what you saw if you went and paid your buck to see it was this thing laid out, and you could see it's kind of snowy, milky ice right here, but where you could see, you could see it was like glass. It was like air. It was clear. You know how ice can be. So you could see very clearly that this was an X living dead thing laying in front of you. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of a man named Ivan Sanderson. When Frank Hansen was trying to get publicity for this, he allowed Ivan Sanderson, a true zoologist and a great cryptozoologist, to study this thing for three full days. Very powerful lights, the whole works. And Sanderson wrote this tremendously detailed technical report about it, much of which I quote in the book. You read that, you will know the man knew what he was looking at from a technical zoology standpoint. I'm looking at it just with layman's eyes when I'm a young man, but they're perfect eyes, astronaut eyes. So I'll tell you what I saw. What you could see, what anybody could see, because the knees were almost to the top of the glass, is that every hair, it's, it, you know how hair floats in water? This is not our hair, this is primate hair, two to three inches long. It's sticking off, it's, it's like a pin cushion off its body. You can see right down to its skin wherever you look. And wherever you look, you're looking at what amounts to a small pencil lead, hair, round tucking into a pore, perfectly tightly round, wherever you look, millions of them, wherever you look. Now, what we're told is this was just a wax and rubber dummy made up by a, a charlatan who was out to just take advantage of people, right? Ask anybody who works in the rubber dummy, I mean wax museum business, and they'll tell you, the one thing you can't do well is hair, because to get the hair right, you've got to punch it in and you, with a tool, and you've got to pull that tool out, and it's going to leave a little nick mark around the hair. None of that in this creature. None. But the thing that really impressed me the most, and I'm sure everybody else will verify this, is you know when you kill a, a deer or something, you let it bleed out, but for a long time after it oozes that pink kind of fluid. You scrape your elbow for women who don't deer hunt. Scrape your elbow, you know, and after a while you're still oozing that pink sticky stuff. Well, that's, it was still doing that when he, when he froze it, when he put the water in. So as the water was freezing, that stuff was coming up in tendrils, ribbons, pink ribbons of that sticky oozy stuff coming out of every wound, out of there, out of the mouth, out of the nose. You know when you have a traumatic head injury, you bleed out of your nose and your mouth as well, out of both eye sockets, out of the wrist. Bones were, little pieces of bone were sticking out of the wrist. Every one of those, and those ribbons went from down as deep in the holes as they could get up to the surface, and they spread out in little pools, little circles at the top of the ice. Now, I defy anybody making a fake to even think to do that, much less pull it off and make it look so real. This was the real deal. Next slide. Perhaps the most interesting story of them all, Zana from Russia, an Alma. Remember I told you that the Almas were also man-sized, 5 to 7 feet tall, 300, 600 pounds, and they're dominant in Russia and the Orient? This is Alma, the living Neanderthal. This is one of them right here. This is Zana is an Alma, was an Alma. Now, understand this. In the Orient, the tradition when one of these things is captured for whatever reason, was to kill it immediately. Desiccate its body and sell its body parts for medicine, principally aphrodisiacs. That's the Oriental tradition. In the Russian area, though, when they would be captured, male or female, they would be used as slaves, physical slaves, held, spirits broken in these uh, primitive villages where they would be, and they would be used to carry wood, fetch water, uh, do the haying, all the heavy work nobody really wants to do. Make the slave do it. And so that became their fate. And for females, another aspect of it was they had to become the sex slaves of the men of the area. And that was one of the other great advantages to having a female. And so this is the fate that befell Zanna in about 1850. She was captured as an adult in 1850. We do not know how old she was. She was an adult. 
She was taken to the village of Tekina where they kept her in a hole for about three years until her spirit was broken enough to let her wander around. She was dependent on them for food and then they began to train her to fetch wood, fetch water, do the things that she had to do. And she became like the village pet for 40 years. She died in 1890. Now, how do we know this? Because in the Orient and Russia, they don't have the same tradition that we have. They're very old countries. They've been living with this for a very long time, for centuries. They know they're real. They send research out, researchers out taking information about it. They send teams out trying to find them, or they used to when Russia had money. They don't now. But this was done in the mid-1970s. Excuse me, I'm sorry, mid-1960s. This research was done in the mid-60s. So, in the mid-1960s, this is an area of Kazakhstan where she lived, where people live very long lives. You know those places in the world where people live up around 120 years old? So they had over 100 people above the age of 80 that had known her quite well in their youth. There were 10 still alive who had attended her funeral. So they were able to get tremendous corroborative evidence, corroborative testimony about her, her lifestyle, and everything about her from all these different people so we have an amazing view of what she was like and what her life was like. Uh, again, a lot of which I go over in, in the book. But the main thing is that she never learned to speak, but she learned the language. They could talk to her and she'd know what they meant. And while there, she gave birth eight times to hybrids with men of the village. Eight times. Killed the first four accidentally because her kind apparently washes the newborn off immediately. She would take it to the freezing glacial river that ran through the village and because they had so much human in them, it would kill them. So the last four, the village women took them from her at birth and raised them on their own because they looked so human and every pair of hands was very valuable in one of those primitive villages like that and so they raised them up and they became Russian citizens. Married, had children, her great-grandchildren are alive in Russia to this day. I know it's an amazing story. Now what do people say about her children? Well, the, everybody said that they were indeed taller than most, bigger than most, ro a little more robust than most, but not giants, not superhumans, just strong, you know, big and strong people. Darker skinned than most, but not, not truly Negroid. Hair like, you know, everybody, but not covered in hair like she was. Average intelligence, not, not wizards, not stupid. Ugly enough to make a freight train take a dirt road. <laughs> Unfortunately for them. But they could speak, that's the key, they could all speak. They had very high-pitched voices, but they could speak, which allowed them to integrate into the community as humans, even though they were clearly not quite humans. So the researchers were real excited to get all this information. It's like, wow. And, th and they knew where she was buried. She was buried in the village cemetery. Unfortunately, this is a Muslim area. They don't mark gravestones there. So they knew she was in the village cemetery, which had existed for centuries, and, and they couldn't say just where because of the 10 people that were alive, they all had different memories of where it had been. Who knew that 70, 80 years later, somebody was going to care? So they couldn't decide. They couldn't, and they would have had to bulldoze the whole thing. The village wouldn't let them do that. So somebody says, well, guess what? Her youngest son, Kvit, died in 1954, only 10 years prior to this study. So they said, we know where he is. We'll let you dig him up. So, boy, they dug him up. Her youngest son, Kvit. Now, before we look at his skull, I want to say again, remember, Neanderthals had bigger brains than we did, and they carry them, we do rather, than they carry them in a bun in the back of their head called the occipital bun. All right, let's take a look at Kvit's, Kvit's skull. Here you go, right here. Notice, if you will, that's a remnant of an occipital, occipital bun right there. Notice how much of a forehead he doesn't have. <laughs> look at the size of these brow ridges. Look at that eye socket. Is it starting to look familiar? Look at the size of that nasal passage. Look at the size of these teeth. Look at the size of that jawbone. Look at the size of the cheekbone. But look at that chin. Allows him to speak. This is an ugly dude, kids. <laughs> this is a Neanderthal, basically. This is a guy you do not want to meet in a dark alley. Now, what, of course, anthropologists say is that he is an extreme variation on the human norm, an extreme... <laughs> real extreme variation on the human norm. But that's how they explain it. 
Okay, I ask you to take my word for it. Hominoids are real. They live with us today. They have always lived with us. It is their planet. They are the native, indigenous, upright walking primate of planet Earth. There was a split somewhere between the down on all four primates and the up on two feet primates, but we're not the one. The prehumans are the prehominoids. Go with me on that. Now, if you do, what it means is, as I said earlier, we human beings do not have a place in the natural scheme of life on Earth. And that's a problem. So if we don't, where did we come from? Why and how did we start leaving fossils on the planet at only 120,000 years ago? All right? Unlike Alan, the speaker you saw earlier, and perhaps unlike some of the others you might hear later, I, I have my own opinion. I don't necessarily agree with him. You're here to evaluate what we say and decide on what you believe. I am a Sitchin, a pro Sitchin person, as you will see. Okay? I have studied, and in part four of my book, I base part four on the writings of Zechariah Sitchin and the ancient Sumerians, because next slide. I believe that the answer to where we came from is, in fact, going to be found in Sumer, ancient Sumer, modern day Iraq, Tigris Euphrates River, Zagros Mountains, the Fertile Crescent. And the Sumerians are the first great culture that we know to come out of the Stone Age. At around 6,000 years ago, they appear full-blown, boop, everything. Uh, over 100 of the first that we attribute to a high culture the Sumerians produced. Now, logic would tell you, and certainly the Darwinian paradigm of simplicity leading to ever more complexity, would tell you that the first culture out of the Stone Age is going to come crawling out of the caves on bloody hands and knees. Are they not? But no. These guys come sailing out and start building beautiful cities and have education and law and everything. Next slide, please. They had the first great cities, the first great city centers, the first high-rise buildings, the first walls, the first roads, the first wheeled vehicles, the first ocean-going vessels, geniuses with water, first agriculture, first animal husbandry, first laws, first court systems, first uh, literature, for, you, you name it. They had it. Hey, well, everything except cable TV, maybe. I mean, they had it. They were great. They were a fantastic culture. And the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans come from their, you know, their culture, those, cu that those cultures develop from what passes down from the Sumerians, or at least out from the Sumerians, I believe. Okay? So, one of the things that they, one of the many things they had at first was writing. Now, this is what we're all taught. We're taught nothing about the Sumerians except that they invented writing. Again, they appear, boop, invent writing, boop, disappear, and that's it. History forgets about them. <laughs> you never hear what they wrote. You never hear what they wrote. And you never hear how sophisticated they were because, again, it doesn't fit that paradigm. It's easier to just start with the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans and move on from there. Okay? What they had to say, next slide, in their writings, they had, their writing, by the way, was cuneiform, very sophisticated math-based writing. And, by the way, their mathematical system called sexagesimal based on the number 60 is better than ours for using very small numbers and very large numbers. And they kept time around the great year, 26,000 years, how they figure that out, among other things. But in their writings, most of it is like these little hand things where it's just bills of lading. I sell you this. I'm buying that from you. It's like our paperwork. But they have a lot of them, about 5,000 of the 100,000 or more that we have, that have to do with stories of their cosmology, their cosmogony, their history, where we came from, how the solar system formed, and all that. And that's what we're going to go over, what they had to say. Where did it come from? Well, originally, when these things were being translated in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when the, when the translators would read what they'd have to say, it was like, oh, come on, forget about it. Put them in the myth. These are myths. They have to be myth. It can't be true. And they put it in the myth, myth pile, which Alan was talking about, myth. So, Zechariah Sitchin, a man named Zechariah Sitchin in the 1950s, says, gets the idea, wait a minute, how does the first culture get a myth? Who hands it to them? <laughs> Good question. Why didn't anybody else think of that? So, he assumes it has to be a history. They have to be telling a history, which then later gets distorted, perhaps, as myth by later cultures, but the first one's got to be a history. So he goes into the myth pile with that attitude and comes out with eight books at this point called the Earth Chronicle series, which I use as the basis for a lot of what you're going to see here now for a while. 
Okay, we're going to go over what the Sumerians had to say, boil down. Part four of my book is basically the cliff notes to Sitchin's work. Any of you that have tried to read it, you know it's a slog at points. Okay, I tried to make it as easy as I could, so at least you have the cliff notes to go in and try it again. All right, next slide. Here's what they say, that originally as the solar system was forming, there was the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, and a big planet called Tiamat, right where the uh, uh, asteroid and it all fits reasonably well except for the asteroid belt where there should be a planet, and there isn't. But there was Tiamat then, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto as a moon of Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and into that forming solar system at around 4 billion years ago, which we extrapolate and assume because all of them were still very plasmid, still very much lava-ish, able to pull moons out of themselves, and we know that the solar system formed at around 4.6 billion years ago. So at around 4 billion years ago would have been the time approximately when this would have happened. Okay, Nibiru comes in, and as it's a stray planet like the one we saw a few months ago being slung out of the binary star system on the news. We all saw that, probably something like that. It's captured by the gravitational pull of the large outer planets, swung around the sun, captured by the sun, and is caught in an elliptical orbit like a comet, moving clockwise as opposed to the counterclockwise circles of the other planets. Well, as you can see, there's the capacity for real problems here with one going one way and one going the other. And in the second time around, Tiamat, I mean, Nibiru collides head on with Tiamat at planetary speeds. This is a collision. Okay? Next slide. This whole thing now is described in the great Sumerian epic of creation called the Enuma Elish, which is six tablets of action, one tablet of summation, which is taken to be by many people the basis for the six days of creation and the one day of rest. Because much of the Old Testament is a direct come down from the Sumerians. And if you know the Sumerian history and read, you read your Sitchin, you will know that or, or my stuff, you will see that that is the case. Now, in that great epic of creation, the Enuma Elish, six, six of the major puzzles of modern astronomy and earth geology are, I think, plausibly answered. You heard Alan's interpretation of some of it. I'm going to give you mine and give you the, the basic Sitchin um, explanation. Okay? What they say is that in the collision, Nibiru slams into Tiamat. It is a little more held together. It's older and so it is coalesced more. It holds together. Tiamat is shattered in two, blown apart, torn in half. And that the lighter outer crust, the crust with the water on it, is scattered in all directions. Boom! Just an explosion, the lighter crust, crust and goes off with the water. Now one of the great mysteries of modern day astronomy is comets. Comets make no sense for this reason. They come from all over the place. In a linear universe, when, you know, the great ball of, of a primordial cloud of dust and gas swirling around flattens out into a pancake to make the solar system, that's the ecliptic. Everything formed in the ecliptic should be in the ecliptic. Nothing should be out of the ecliptic, and yet comets come from all over the place. So they had to be removed out to where they are some kind of way, but we don't have any idea. So they come up with this fantastic thing called the Oort cloud, which is so far away you can't imagine. It, it, the Oort cloud is one of the biggest jokes out there. And that's how they explain comets, because they can't explain them any other way. But the problem with comets is they have water in them. And anything out in space is not going to produce water. You produce water by being a cooling planet with lava spewing up the steam and stuff like that, and it condenses, etc. So comets have to begin in a planet. Now, this explains it, I think, plausibly well. Nothing that they will throw at you to explain comets will do it. All right, number two, the other great mystery, the asteroid belt. What they say is that the inner viscous magma inside Tiamat in the collision was strung out the bowels of the planet. The guts were ripped out and strung out and broke into little pieces. That's the asteroid belt. They called it the hammered bracelet. We call it the asteroid belt. But there it is, and that's a fairly plausible explanation for it. Again, this doesn't make sense because, as you heard, the exploded planet theory. Problem is, when a planet explodes, it ought to just go boom everywhere. It shouldn't be hanging around. Doesn't make sense for a number of reasons. Okay, now, the third one is uh, Pluto. 
Pluto's a problem because it's, as you've all been hearing lately, they're trying to downgrade it, it doesn't belong, it doesn't fit. It has an orbit that's not like the others, it carries inside the orbit of Neptune, and it's 17 degrees off the ecliptic. Again, nothing should be off the ecliptic. What they say is that Nibiru, as it swung around, it pulled Pluto away from Saturn, its original home, and dropped it out where it is now. Now, all astronomers know Pluto is not a natural planet. It, got, it started life as a moon of an inner planet. They know that. But they have no idea how it could have gotten moved out to where it is. Here you go. Here's a reasonable answer right here. Now, let's talk about Earth. Three great mysteries here. Life. Well, first of all, let's establish that Earth is a remnant of this. What happens is Nibiru's moon bangs into the remnant of Tiamat and, like pool balls, boop, hitting, knocks it inside the orbit of Mars and it reestablishes there and becomes the Earth, the remnant of Tiamat. Now, Earth has a one great mystery is life. How did life come to be? Life appears, despite what you're told about the lightning bolt into the, into the pre primordial uh, soup and all that, forget it. That's just a joke. That's just a fantasy fairy tale to tell people that don't want to know the truth and to tell kids in school. That's what they're teaching to this day. We know very well that the first forms of life to appear on Earth appear suddenly. They're very sophisticated bacteria, prokaryo prokaryotic bacteria, and there's not one, there's two kinds, and they appear at around four billion years ago. Suddenly, overnight, strata without, strata with, two kinds, sophisticated bacteria, relative to what that first living form would have been. If I had done the first part of my show, you would see all that. Okay, you can get the tape or let, get one tape and put it in a room and let everybody see it if you want to. But anyway, the point is, life is a great mystery. How it would suddenly appear four billion years ago, here you go. It says in the tablets, in the collision between Nibiru and Tiamat, in the mingling of their waters, Nibiru passed life to Tiamat, to the remnant of Tiamat. Perfect explanation for the sudden appearance of two sophisticated life forms on the remnant. Now, the remnant now is over here with its moon, Kingo, Kingu, and has gone over, and now we're looking at two major differences in Earth and all other astral bodies out there. Earth is missing a huge portion of its crust, and it has plate tectonics, movement in the plates. How could that happen? No explanation. Why? Because in the vacuum, any liquid in a vacuum, what does it do? You see it in the space shuttle all the time. They let orange juice or milk. It makes the smallest, tightest ball it can make. That is what a liquid does in a vacuum. Smallest, tightest ball it can make. Now, that is what all the other astral bodies have done. They don't have plate tectonics. There's nowhere for the plates to go. They're as tight as they can be. Where do plate tectonics come from? In the collision, the backside of Tiamat is cracked like an eggshell. Cracked like an eggshell. There are the plates. There are the plates. And when it, the missing crust, of course, is when it, the, the half is there, it's still viscous. It's still magma. So what's it going to do? It's going to tighten itself down into a new ball, much smaller than the old one had been. And what's going to happen? It's going to have a big chunk gone, a big missing piece of itself, a big hole in itself in its skin. And so it, that scar is going to break up into pieces as the plates move around and we have the plate tectonics and we have the missing surface that we know about today. Next slide please. And we'll take a look at just a representation of what it looks like with the water gone. Not to scale of course, but you get the idea. This is not like any other planet or moon out there. Something happened. And I think the Enuma Elish gives a plausible explanation for what that was and for all the other things that I mentioned as well. Next slide. Now, when the dust settled, here's what we had. The solar system as we know it today, with Nibiru moving in this clockwise 3,600-year orbit, and I say it, was, and it passes outside the orbit of Mars, inside the inner edge of the asteroid belt, and the last time with through, I think, was around 200 B.C., which means it's just past Apelian out here, and it's going to be back around 3400 A.D., about 1400 years. We don't have to worry about it if I'm right. You will get arguments about these dates. 
Some people use textual interpretations. I use the date of the last, uh, the ending of the Ice Age, which I believe was caused by Nibiru passing through and lifting the tides. You can read about why I think that in the book. And I use the dating of the ice cores and the tree rings of science. I try to make my work as scientifically based as I can because I expect someday to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those guys and I want to be able to do it on their turf in their terms. Okay? So, next slide. All right. This is some of the proof for what that story that you've just heard. And it starts with cylinder seals. And I just want you to see what a cylinder seal is. There are about 5,000 of these that we have. They were their printing press. It was just a, a thing that would roll out on the clay to leave little pictures like this. Now, when they had a story to tell, they told it in the tablets like you saw. But when they had an event that everybody would know the event, like I showed you that cartoon, and everybody here, we all knew in a very small space that was talking about millions of words and thousands of volumes about evolution. Am I right? We all knew. Well, that, they would all know this was the story of the time the gods or whoever gave the water to the water buffalo or whatever. The point is, notice the fine detail in the best of the cylinder seals and then realize that these are basically two to three inches high. They're like big spools of thread. Made out of precious and semi-precious stone, carved in a circular format so that they roll out flat and three-dimensionally. Now, when asked how this was done, science says, well, they could only have bored little holes into the rock and then abraded them out like they, you know, to the degree that they wanted. Well, you know, the sand would be bigger than the holes you need to do this. Some of this work, anyway, there, there's just no way. Lasers, this is not even an inch square here. Lasers would have a hard time doing this if they could do it. Nobody knows how they did this. They're just pulling one out of the hat on you. Okay, next slide. This is the one I want you to see. This is a much older one, much more worn, as you can see. 4,500 years, 4,500 years, 2,500 B.C. It's called, the, it's VA 243. It's in a museum in Berlin. It's well dated. And it's called the granting of the plow. This is a seated God. See him in his chair with a plow in his hand. And this is a standing God. And this is a human. How do we know they're gods? Because they have horns on their helmets. Horns on their helmets. Notice the horns. This is how you signify gods, or they did anyway, the Sumerians did on their cylinder seals. And I want you to pay special attention to this because later at the banquet we might see a real live Anunnaki helmet. We might see that. Okay, now, normally they would put astrological signs, I'm excuse me, astronomical signs up here to indicate who the god was because not everybody would know. But in this one, obviously, everybody knew. And as you can see, this kind of, the, the human is carrying this kind of skunky old digging stick that the, the most primitive people have, even to this day. And this new wooden plow here, 4,500 years ago, we can go to Egypt today and see this very plow, and in many other third world countries still being used, this very plow. Okay, so no question it's the granting of the plow. But this is what makes this special right here. Let's see a blow up of that. What is this? Solar system, right. Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, in their relative sizes, mind you. Earth, Moon, think how small that is, what grain of sand dug that out. Mars, and then, uh-oh, what should be here? This should be the asteroid belt. This is Nibiru, folks, Nibiru. Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto as a moon of Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Notice that it's only a little bit bigger than Uranus, Neptune. It's about three times bigger than Earth. Nibiru is a good-sized planet good sized planet according to this okay now again what proof do we have of any of this let's take some look let's take a look at this all right here's a look at the solar system that you don't get to very often and did it occur to any of you that we were looking at a cylinder seal carved at 4,500 years ago that had Uranus in it that we only discovered in 1781 when our telescopes got good enough to see it it had Neptune, when we, we discovered in 1846, when our telescopes got good enough to see it, and Pluto, which we discovered in 1930, when our mathematicians got good enough to tell our astronomers where to look for the thing, because it was so small. What are the Sumerians doing, knowing about that? Furthermore, what are they doing writing in one of their tablets that if you look at these two, Uranus and Neptune, in the heavens, meaning right out on them, they look like blue-green watery twins. When we didn't find that out, we thought they were just big old gas bags like Jupiter and Saturn until Voyager went out there in 86 and 89 and found that, lo and behold, they really are blue-green watery twins. What the Sumerians said 4,500 years ago. 
Furthermore, they didn't count the way we do. Earth was not the third rock from the sun for them. It was number seven. So that means they were counting from out here and they were putting Pluto in its correct place. What are they doing with all that knowledge? Well, they make no bones about it. They say everything that we know, everything that we are, everything that we have comes from the people living on Nibiru. The people living on Nibiru came to Earth and gave us everything that we have, everything that we know, our great culture. Now, what's the proof of that? Is there any proof that any ancient advanced civilization was ever on Earth at any point in the dim or distant past? Yes, yes. The megalithic structures out there, the pyramids, Tiwanaku, Baalbek, Teotihuacan, Stonehenge, you name it, a couple of dozen of them. All of those are impossible for human beings to recreate today. And yet we are told in another one of these great fantasies that they were somehow created by people in ancient times, ancient Egyptians or ancient Sumerians or anybody. Somehow or, way or other they did it. And it's just absolute malarkey. Impossible. Now, some, Egypt, next slide, some Egyptian scholars tried to prove it by <laughs> getting down in with some pink granite here and wailing away with some stones for a few hours and tore their hands up and walked out of there saying, well, you know, we couldn't make much of a dent in it, but boy, you know those old folks, they sure had a lot of time on their hands, and somehow they figured out a way to do it. <laughs> Wouldn't give an inch after this. Wouldn't give an inch. It's ridiculous. Now, here's the stone they're working on. Next slide. Some of you may have seen this. This is an ancient 1,170-ton obelisk lies unfinished at the Aswan Quarry. A crack rendered the stone unusable. It's pink granite. They were making it into an obelisk like the one you saw in Allen's slides. Okay? It's about 100 feet long. It's about 12 feet wide, 12 feet deep on a side. Imagine the Washington Monument just squared off. And it's pretty much done. But now let's, let's move this from the Stone Age. Let's move it through the age of copper because copper wouldn't make a dent in that. And let's move it into the Bronze Age. Bronze will, will, will chip on it. Bronze will take a little bit of it out. Now, let's put our bronze chisels or hatchets or whatever in the hands of some guys and get them down in this crack and put them to work. How do you think they're going to fare in there? Pretty tight fit. <laughs> Plastic man might have a tough time up in there. But the point is, they've got it pretty much done. They're working on the spire here when they break it. You know how it works. You press here, you get this. Well, look, does this look like somebody chipping away with a little hand? No. This looks like a belt sander taking pieces out the size of the chair you're sitting on. Huge chunks of pink granite, one of the hardest stones in the world, just being ripped out. And they press too hard with whatever machine they've got here. And you know your physics. You get stress back here, and they popped it. They broke it. And they just said, whoops, we busted that one. And they just unhooked it and went somewhere else and left it for us to marvel at and wonder how they could have done it. But now let's go ahead and say they didn't bust it and they finished it. These primitive people now who managed somehow to do this. They finished it. It's ready to go. The hole, by the way, is about 15 feet deep. That's the top of it up there. But still, what's the first thing they've got to do? They got, somebody's got to draw straws to get down there with his hatchet and cut it loose from the bottom. Now, who's going to do that with 1,100 tons sitting on top of him? We could not get our best diamond tip blades to cut through underneath this thing. The weight would stop the blade. We could not, the, word, the operative word here is impossible. We could not get this out of here. And yet they did it time and time and time again. To lift it out, just if we could somehow cut it loose, we would have to take a dozen of our largest movable cranes to ring that hole just to get it up. You're being lied to, folks. That's the main thing you've got to understand. You're being lied to. It's absolutely impossible for this one stone, this one stone proves that none of the megaliths were made by those people in that era. And this, again, is not the biggest one. They have them in Baalbek twice that big. Okay? Next slide. All right. What we're told is that the Anunnaki came to earth for this, gold. 
mining gold. And that originally the story is they landed in ancient Sumer, but not 6,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago, 430,000 approximately to be exact. 400,000 years ago they land in modern day Iraq and they set up shop in the Tigris Euphrates Valley and they call their home away from home, their home away from Nibiru, the Eden. You'll see a poster out there by my thing, Anunnaki over Eden, that's what that means. Because that poster is the Tigris River Valley that the symbol is rising above. That is where it was. That is where Eden was, according to them, and that comes down in the Bible as such. So they set up camp, and they placer mined the gold out of those rivers. What do they need gold for? They needed to repair their atmosphere, and their rise to high technology, they had damaged that big, three times the size of Earth atmosphere, the same exact way we're damaging ours in our rise to high technology, and they ultimately had to repair it with very fine particulates of gold, like talcum powder, blown up into the stratosphere above it so it would ride above there and act as a reflector and an insulator from cosmic rays, which is, you know, you see that on the masks of astronauts and in the, sh in the uh, capsule and all that. Gold is a wonderful stopper of cosmic rays. So that's what they had to repair it with. It's what we will have to repair it with. We'll have to do exactly the same thing when the day comes for us to have to face up to what we're doing to our planet. Okay, so they came, they placed her mind out of the river, and all that is is you put a tray in the water, you let the water sweep over, the water uh, drops the gold into these cloth, every few weeks you pick it up, and it's real easy, it's the way we do it now when we have the opportunity. But you tap out any stream system, ultimately, and they did. After about 150,000 years, they had tapped it out. And so they decided they were going to split themselves up and go where the mother load of gold was on the planet Earth, which is what it is today, southern Africa. So they divided themselves into the upper world, which remained the Eden, and the Abzu, which was the lower world, and you didn't want to go to the lower world because you had to get in the holes and dig the gold. And they didn't like it. So the Anunnaki revolted. They said, we don't want to do this. We want a slave to do this work for us. Plus, it was a hardship duty, mostly men. You know, why don't you make us some women while you're at it? So that's what they did. They decided to use the creatures of Earth, which would be the hominoids, and I say it would have been the almas, the likeliest candidate. They took the creatures of Earth to get some of their genetic material to make the new slave better adapted physically to the planet than they were, but the slave would for the most part be like themselves. We shall make the Adamu, A-D-A-M-U, which comes down as Adam, and we shall make the Adamu in our own image after our own likeness, which comes down word for word. And that is what they did. They made their slave inferior models of themselves. That's us, folks. That's us. We're really inferior models of the Anunnaki. And as you saw in the cylinder seal, we look like them. We look like in their own image after their own likeness. In all of the cylinder seals, we look just like them. We don't have the horns on our headgear. That's about it. We are them. We have, that's why we're not adapted to this planet. That's why we're so obviously not a part of this planet. We have their bones. We don't have primate bones. We have their muscles. We don't have primate muscles. We have their skin. We don't have primate skin. We have their body pattern. I mean, their hair patterns on their body is ours. We have thickest on our front, thinnest on our back. Primates have thick on the back, thin on the front. We have their eyes, their poor night vision eyes. We have their foreheads. We have their brains. That's the key to this. We have their brains. That's why we're not like anything else on this planet. We are them. We are genetically engineered copies of them. Okay, next slide. Let's take a look at how that was done. Human body contains 100 trillion cells. There is a nucleus inside each human cell except red blood cells. Each nucleus contains 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 pairs. One chromosome of every pair is from each parent. The chromosomes are filled with tightly coiled strands of DNA. Genes are segments of DNA that contain instructions to make proteins the building blocks of life. This is where Genetic engineering takes place. Now, we're going to go over it lightly, but it's very important. I want you to understand these things that I'm going to tell you now. Okay, next slide. 
Don't worry about the details and how they do it. This is what they do. They can open up a cell, our genetic engineers can, I mean our genetic geneticists can. We can open up a cell, open up the nucleus, pull out strands of DNA, and in that strand, 98% of it will be what's called junk DNA. We don't know what it does. If it has a function, we don't know what it is. 2% will be what are called, prosaically enough, the working segments. They work. They do what they're supposed to do. They make the proteins. Now, if you cut in the junk above a working segment and in the junk below and remove it and have done the same with another strand of DNA over here, you can move anything into anything else. It can be animal into plant, plant into animal, fish into fowl. It does not matter because all living things at the most fundamental level are exactly alike. Understand that. We're all made of the same four base pairs, the same 20 amino acids. Everything's the same at the most basic level. It's like it's, it's pop beads that are interchangeable. It is almost as if somebody designed it that way so they could just mix and match the parts and make anything they wanted, isn't it? Something to think about. Okay, but the problem with it from an engineering standpoint is this. You're not cutting with a blade. These are not precise cuts. The blade would have to be a few molecules thick. You're cutting with chemicals, chemicals. Now, the chemicals can cut pretty accurately, but mistakes are going to happen. Something's going to ooze out where it doesn't belong. Something's going to splash over it where it doesn't belong. Mistakes are going to happen. Inevitable. We know that. We make mistakes all the time. Another problem with genetic engineering is you don't know what you're going to get when you do this. You can't predict. You have to decide what you're going to do. You have to do it. You have to let it express, which is live, and see what you get, and then use that to determine what you do the next time. And, the, of course, the great fear in genetic engineering is somebody's going to make a mistake and create the Andromeda strain that's going to kill us all. A legitimate concern, although everybody's very careful, and I'm not too worried about it. But mistakes do happen because all of this is so incredibly microscopic. It's out of the nucleus of your cells, imagine how microscopic it is. But don't try to figure it out. I can't even figure it out. <laughs> it's really complex. But they do it. Okay, understand that. Now, with that in mind, let's look at some of the proofs that I say indicate very clearly that we are, in fact, what the Sumerians say, a genetically engineered species by the Anunnaki. Next slide. Okay, here we go. The cerebral cortex is the deeply convoluted surface region of a brain that is most strongly linked to intelligence, lower right. It's the stained part out here. If you peel that off of the brain of a rat, it will cover a postage stamp. Peel it off of a monkey, it'll cover a postcard. Peel it off a chimp, it'll cover a sheet of typing paper. Peel it off of us, and it'll cover four sheets of typing paper. Now, you can see this is a transition. This is clearly a transformation. Now, there's some weird things about it. These guys are using all they've got, all they've got. We're using one half of one page in a very different way than they are using what they have. One half of one page, how do we know? We all know, we use about 10% of our brains. We know that from the studies done with idiot savants, you know that, and we, we know there are thousands of miles of neural network in our heads not being used, we don't know why. We don't know why, I'll tell you why. We shall make the atom who's strong but not too strong, smart but not too smart. They sealed it off genetically at the 10% mark or wherever it is. We don't know exactly where it is, but wherever it is, they sealed us off. You don't want your slave to be anywhere near as smart as you. You, in fact, want your slave to be so decidedly inferior to you that you never have to worry about treating it like a slave. So they engineered us to be really clever to ourselves, but for them, we were smart enough to talk, take instructions, act with a little bit of ingenuity and self-reliance. They could turn things over to us and kind of let us take over and do it. They gave us just enough to be wonderful in our own eyes, but be pond scum relative to them. <laughs> it's what they did. So, it's pretty clear in as much as that, and now understand with the idiot savants, for those of you that don't know the proof about this, idiot savants get some beam of light in the damage to the good 10. They get some beam of light and it will strike somewhere in the other 90%. You all saw Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, remember? Well, they get it in math, they get it in music, they get it in sculpture, art, whatever, wherever it strikes. Now, if there's just one, we could say, well, that's a freak of nature. But we've had lots of them, lots of them. So we know that all of this is out there. It's in our heads. We just can't access it. We just can't use it. 
But if it wasn't in our heads, it wouldn't be in their heads. So we know that it happened. We just, they have no idea how. Well, I say that the Anunnaki did it deliberately, and that makes sense to me. Next slide. Okay, mitochondrial DNA, late 1980s, you might remember this. In humans, over 99.99% of a cell's DNA is packed into the cell nucleus with a small amount occurring outside the nucleus in small structures called mitochondria. That's these babies right here. They're about 16,000 base pairs long. Now, when you have a mixing and a mating, the, the DNA in the nucleus mixes, mixes. But with the mitochondrial DNA, it does not. Sperm doesn't have mitochondrial, eggs do. And so females pass it down intact generation after generation. Well, when this was figured out in the 70s, Boy, the, the, uh, the botanist and the uh, geneticist said, great, great. Now we can go and find out if the split from the common ancestor was closer to 8 million years or closer to 5 million years. Remember that? We're going to now pin it down. It's going to be one or the other. We're going to figure it out. So they went out and they took the mitochondrial DNA of women all around the world, every race, every creed, every culture, every country, and they brought them back to the lab and they started working on them. And when the answers came in in the late 1980s, it was not 8 million years ago. It wasn't 5 million years ago. It was way, way, way the heck down to 200 to 250,000 years ago, and that's all. We don't exist genetically beyond 200 to 250,000 years. And of course, needless to say, the anthropologist said, you guys are nuts. We've got these skulls showing, these bodies showing, these prehumans showing that we go back millions of years. What's the matter with you? And the geneticist said, we couldn't have been wrong that many times. <laughs> Impossible. We'll do it again. And they have. They've done it. It always comes out the same, 200, outside 250,000 years ago. That's it. We're brand spanking new brand new on this planet. Now, there's still a lot of people, thanks, there's still a lot of people that will not accept that. A lot of people that will not accept that. But it is true and it is becoming more and more acceptable for as outrageous as it is. Now, not only do we know when we were created, we know where, where. Because the oldest of us consistently kept coming in in southern Africa. Next slide. And in fact, the cover of Newsweek in 1987 showed that if in fact there was an Adam and Eve, they were black. They would have to have been black. But of course, they knew the flack they were going to catch in the South, at least, so they made the blacks look as white as they could. <laughs> this guy looks almost as white as OJ, doesn't he? But the point is, in trying to have it both ways, they caught it coming and going because you can imagine the, the letters to the editor after this issue. But the point is, it tells the truth. The oldest of us do come from southern Africa, and we definitely are 200 to 250,000 years old, and guess what else? That is just what the Sumerians say about us, that the Anunnaki created us around 200 to 250,000 years ago in southern Africa to dig their gold. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. Okay, next slide. Okay, what happens when a creature is born in the wild, severely screwed up physically? What happens to it? Dies, right? Parents will kill it. It will not put that defect into the gene pool. You're looking at the great exception. You're looking at 28 of our severe, I mean, of our most severe genetic defects, but we have 4,000 and counting. 4,000 and counting. Now, we're only 200, 250,000 years old. We shouldn't have one. We've got 4,000 and counting. How did it happen? Cutting and splicing process mistakes. Cutting and splicing, oops, made a mistake. Cutting and splicing, oops, made a mistake. They don't care. They're making a slave. They're not going to fix the mistakes. What do they care if it's 1 in 100 dies from the problems? If it's 1 in 10, they don't care. They're making a mistake. I mean, they're making a slave. But they know the numbers like we have found out the hard way. If you let, if you let the pop population propagate naturally, those numbers go way down for each person. Right now, as we sit here, we average about 50 of the 4,000, each of us. And we have a mating with our mate. If we share any of those 50, then each of our offspring will have a one in four chance of expressing it. That's why you'll get mongoloids in the best of families, mongoloids in the lowest of families, and all around the world. And that's what genetic defects are. In the wild, you will get two-headed calves and six-legged goats. That's a sperm-egg misconnect. 
That's not something that you see steadily on and on. A little gem like spina bifida, which is not going to let you live to adulthood, nor is it going to let you reproduce if you do. What's that doing in a gene pool? It was all put there, folks. Put there. No question. Next slide. Okay, here we go with the chromosome match. It's kind of hard to see comparison, rather. Humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans right here. And you see how similar they are, and as we know that uh, between humans and chimpanzees, there's 99% similarity in the DNA and 98% with gorillas. And it's like, oh, well, then that, that we're just kissing cousins. That's as close as you can be. We're almost the same thing. Well, not really, because... It's, we're talking about a 3 billion base pair genome. 1%, that's 30 million base pairs. That's a couple thousand strands of DNA. That's, if you know what you're doing, that's a lot of change. But also understand that all higher animals, and ever say this, share 50% and up. Squirrel, 50% and up. You see? So it, it isn't quite as astounding as it seems. But what we're looking at here is the Anunnaki have got themselves a real problem, a real problem. And that problem is this. They come to Earth and they decide they're going to make the slave. They, take, they decide we're going to use this creature of Earth, let's say it was an Alma. They test the blood and what do they find? First thing, big problem, 48 chromosomes. All primates, all primates have 48 chromosomes. But they, the Anunnaki, have only 46 chromosomes. How do we know that? Because we have 46 chromosomes. We descend from primates and yet somehow we lose two whole chromosomes, that's an awful lot of DNA, and somehow we're so much better than them. Well, they have 68 or something like that relative to them. But we don't. We have 46. So we know this was the result of the genetic engineering. And they had a problem, the Anunnaki did. What could they do? They had to, they, you know, it, how it works. There's, there's 24 in uh, sperm and egg, 23 sperm and egg. So you've got to get the sperm and the egg to match up, one or the other, 23 or 24. Can you take out a chromosome from the creature of Earth, the 24, and still have a creature of Earth? No. Can you add a chromosome to yourself and still have an Anunnaki go up to 24 from 23? No. You've got a real problem. It's an insoluble problem. And you need that because you've got to get the first hybrid to get in the game of the genetic engineering. You've got to get something alive that is a blending of you two to begin to work on it. So what can you do? How can you solve that problem? There's only one way, and boy, is it smart. You go in and you look and you compare the chromosomes, and you find two that can be fused and will take up one space but maintain the integrity of all the chromosomal material. You find a spot where you can fuse two to make one, and now you've got all the material but taken up one place, and now you're ready to rock and roll. You with me? All right, let's look at the number two chromosome close up. They just went to the second one. They just looked down the row and they said, okay, this will work. Orangutan, two and three. Gorilla, two and three. Chimp, two and three. Human. Uh-oh. Fusion. How long do you think it would take Mother Nature to do this? There is no clearer proof that we're genetically engineered just like they say we are. Next slide. And so, I think it's fair to say that everything we know is wrong, at least about human origins, that we were given life by the gods with a small g through the equivalent of a test tube, and that our, we originally we were the hair-covered hominoids and that our humanity emerged from that. Now, this is where I normally end it, and they tell me I'm running out of time, so I want to get to the new thing that I want to share with you. Oh, no, where did I? Oh, here it is. Uh, because this is really exciting to me. Uh, on the 12th of this month, which was just recently, I received an, an email from a person who wants to remain anonymous. And this is what he said to me. He is a geneticist, a full-blown geneticist. And he says, Dear Mr. Pye, I agree with your conclusions and will give you a few hints, if you wish, as a DNA deep throat. First, look up the huge discontinuities between man and the various apes for whole mitochondrial DNA genes for the Rh factor, and human Y chromosomes, among others. Regarding number three, the chromosomes, I refer you to K.D. Smith's 1987 study titled Repeated DNA Sequences of the Human Y Chromosome. It says most human Y chromosome sequences so far examined do not have homologs, which are similar sequences, on the Y chromosomes of other primates. 
Human female DNA does look somewhat ape-like, but not the male Y. This means that if we are a crossbred hybrid species, as you contend, meaning me, the cross had to be between a female ape-like creature, a creature of the earth, as the Sumerians said, and a male person from elsewhere, as I also contend. He goes on to say, what the evolutionists do is find certain genes which look very similar between man and ape, then they make a tree of descent while ignoring those huge impassable abysses of difference elsewhere. Also, by certain methods of DNA dating, one can tell that numerous genes have been recently added to the human genome. If workers in my field were to say such things openly, we would be ostracized, as I also contend and forced to live in a tent. Any work along these lines would be rejected without any form of appeal. So what can we do? Sincerely, DNA Deep Throat. Now, <laughs> what this means, thank you, what this means is we win. We win. Because where one of these came from, more of these are going to come. As my pro profile rises higher, and I think, frankly, that I'm the only person out here pushing this genetic stuff that you're seeing like this, more of these are going to come my way. We're going to win. You've seen the evidence. Now, we're, right now, we're getting our brains kicked out. We are getting our brains kicked out. That's why we're called the fringe. And the reason is we keep mounting these frontal attacks on the establishments. And every film that we produce, every photograph, every sighting, every testimony, every capture, every, uh, every encounter that we have, and we throw at them with the best intentions, our word is truth, is it not? Yep. Our word is truth. It's true. It's true. And their word is what? Liar. Liar. They dress it up, they say, well, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know what you're seeing, you made a mistake, it was swamp gas, whatever. They're basically standing there and saying, you're just a bunch of liars. We're right and you're wrong, and because it is our word against their word, our word truth, their word liar, their word wins. Day in, day out, year after year. It's very frustrating, is it not? Boy, it just annoys the heck out of me. But what this means is we're going to win in the end. Why? Because the genes say so. The genes back us up. And right now, this is not a field that you're very familiar with. And I've worked very hard to make this very simplistic so you could understand at least the fundamentals, and it's the same in my book. You need to be aware of this is because this is the back door, kids. This is the back. We're not going to storm them from the front. We've been doing it for years. They know how to deal with us. Our word against them, we're going to lose. But in this instance, the genetic end of it, what is it? It's their word against them. It's their research against them. They're going to lose. We're going to beat them with the genetic evidence. we got to beat them. We will beat them. We know we're right. We know they're wrong. They know they're wrong. They know they're wrong. We just have to get mentally tough and accept that this is a war. This is a fight. This is not, gentlemen, Marquis de Queensberry rules. This is a dog fight. This is a knife fight. And you all have got to get out there and proselytize. You have to familiarize yourself with these basics at least. And instead of throwing things at them that are going to bounce off like BBs off a barn door, you got to start throwing some darts. This stuff will do it. This will do it. We can win. We're going to win. Thank you.